It's now time for the Weekly with News 6 Morning Anchor, Justin Warmith. This is the Weekly on ClickOrlando.com with Justin Warmith. Good morning, I'm Justin Warmoth. Perhaps one of the most hotly contested down-ballot races this year is the race for District 9 in the state Senate, which represents all of Seminole County and a portion of Volusia. Republican Jason Broder and Democrat Patricia Sigmund squaring off to replace David Simmons in what's turning out to be one of the most expensive Florida Senate races on record. I had a chance to interview Sigmund this week to learn more about her background and platform. My name is Patricia Sigmund. I am a mother, a small business owner, a voter protection leader, and a labor and employment lawyer. And I've spent over 25 years right here in Senate District 9 in Seminole County uh, fighting for people who've been mistreated because of their age, their race, their sex, their disability, people who are whistleblowers fired for doing the right thing, people who've been sexually harassed or abused, people fighting for their unemployment benefits, people fighting for equal pay, for equal work, and more. And really what I've been doing through all of that is standing up and fighting for the people over the powerful. Mm -hmm. And that is why I'm running for Florida Senate District 9, because it is very clear that it is long past time our government put the people first in Tallahassee. And that means things like uh, affordable, quality, accessible health care. And expanding Medicaid is a big part of that. And we'll talk more about that, I'm sure. And well, fully funding our public education and our clean, protecting our clean water and environment and making sure that we are fixing this, this cruel and broken unemployment system and, and really putting the people first in all those ways and more. And, you know, I spent, I have raised all three of my kids here, all through the public schools. They're all in their 20s now. And I've been a, an active part of this community. I've been serving in the voter protection program since 2004 making sure that every eligible voter can cast their ballot and have it count. And I love this community and I love this area. I want to help make sure it moves forward in a way that's positive for our kids and for generations to come and for the people that are here now and, and hurting because of, because of COVID and, and pulling us forward. Our political analyst believes that this state Senate race uh, could be the most expensive on record. Um, what, what does that tell you? It tells me how important it is. It tells me how pivotal it is. And I, you know, right now there are 17 Democrats in the Florida Senate. We believe that we will have at least 19 coming out of this mm -hmm. election. That puts us within one of parity. And the par that close to parity and parity um, gets us to a really important place of discussion that hasn't been happening in our legislature for, for over 20 years, because right now it is just so far lopsided that there's no balance. There's no push and pull of, of worthy uh, parties on both sides that have enough power to, to force a good, solid negotiation and discussion and, and make sure that all these issues are really addressed. When they got close in Virginia, before they flipped both of their chambers, that's when they got Medicaid expansion. And in Florida, that'll bring about 800,000 people into insurance who don't have insurance right now, including about 40,000 veterans who need that coverage. And it'll bring $14.3 billion into our state economy over five years, which is very important all the time, but even more so now in a COVID-19 recovery. It'll bring thousands of good paying healthcare jobs and help stabilize insurance premiums for those fortunate enough to have insurance. So those are the kinds of things we know that we can do when we're really close to parity. Um, because they did it in Virginia. And we've got redistricting coming up, which is very important. So it's, what it tells me is this race is very important because it's such a pivotal moment. We see, we're seeing where we are. The state is growing and changing. Our area is the fastest changing red to blue district in the entire state of Florida. And we are really at the heart of that. And I am really honored to be able to, to carry that forward for the people because this seat isn't about me, it's not for me, it's for all of us and to put the people's voice in Tallahassee. You know, uh, a lot of folks have seen um, the ads, both positive and negative on you and your opponent. Um, they s seemingly they run uh, pretty frequently throughout the day, at least from, from my vantage point. Uh, your opponent has been, just to clear the air uh, for our viewers, your opponent's been uh, attacking you for allegedly receiving federal coronavirus money meant for businesses. Those are false. Uh, what would you like to tell voters who might see that and 
become skeptical to maybe vote for you? Thank you for that question. Don't be fooled. It's, it's just a false attack. It's designed to distract voters from the fact that when Jason Broder was in the Florida House, he has a voting record from that time and his conduct during that time that is something they don't want to talk about. Uh, he voted against our health care and against Medicaid expansion and all the positive things I just explained happened with Medicaid expansion. He voted against all that. He voted to cut uh, $1.3 billion from our kids' public education. You know, when the chips were down and, and decisions had to be made about the budget, he deprioritized it and put public education um, at the bottom and made cuts. Uh, he voted four times, not once, not twice, not three, but four times to allow his friend Chris Dorworth to build a high density uh, development called River Cross in our rural boundary. And then um, has had all kinds of crazy explanations as to why that was an accident or an errant button, but he says he's proud of his record. I mean, he, he cut some corrupt deals. He made a deal for $2.5 million in taxpayer money with another state house member. And they got this grant and never delivered the product to the jobs they promised. And audits afterwards called it textbook corruption. Um, that and so much more. And really just the refusal to take down an ad that has been repeatedly proven false. You know, we can't, we can't trust Jason in office when he is lying about my campaign and everybody knows that PPP ad is a lie, but he, he won't stop. Let's, uh, I want to move to real quickly, amendment two on the ballot this year, which is raising Florida's minimum wage to eventually $15 an hour. Where do we stand on that? Yes, um, it is, it is important. We have to value workers. And we saw in COVID-19 that we count on our minimum wage workers to get out there and, and put themselves in harm's way and wake up at four in the morning and go do these jobs that we need done. And we need them to, to have a, a fair and living wage. I mean, they have, they have earned it. They are working hard. And um, they are the heartbeat and the lifeblood of our, of our economy and our, and our work. We're a service economy. We are a tourist-based economy, although I think we really need to expand into uh, some additional areas so that we, that we, we insulate ourselves from, from these future downturns. We can talk about that if you'd like. But we, we cannot expect people, people can't live on, on what the minimum wage is. I mean, they just, they just can't live on it. You're, we're, we're working two or three jobs just to make ends meet. And what happens is people get sick, they get injured because they're not sleeping. They are run down their families suffer, they can't help the kids with the homework. You know, this is a fundamental problem. So we need to bring that up. And yes, absolutely, $15 an hour amendment is important. It is gradual. Mm -hmm. It has very broad support. You know, I was out at the uh, Orlando airport uh, standing with workers from, um, from SEIU 32BJ and talking with all of them. And you know, when you hear their stories and how hard they're working and how many jobs they're working just to keep it together, it, it's just this, this should have happened a long time ago. And I'm, I'm really excited because I believe it's gonna pass. Coming up, Sigmund will explain her ideas when it comes to Florida's unemployment system, criminal justice reform, and public education. Stay with us. Add some wow to weekend breakfast with Nutella. Nutella goes with pancakes and sleeping in with waffles and smiles. Wake up to wow with Nutella. New Six and Centra Care have teamed up to offer everyone flu shots for free. Just visit this week's location to make sure you and your whole family stay healthy this flu season. Stay protected this flu season. Join New Six and Centra Care at this week's location for a free flu shot. Multiply your winnings up to 200 times with Times the Cash Scratch-Offs. The, the Florida Lottery, it's your ticket. It. With Sidecar Health, I actually go to the doctor. Sidecar Health is really different. You choose exactly the amount of coverage that you want. You choose any doctor that you want to go to. It's the new way forward in insurance.
one last spread across the yard Whoever knew saying goodbye could be this hard Now our nitrogen release is slow Cause through the winter we lie low Goodbye Seminole County government and its partners want to remind you to fertilize responsibly. Check out the facts at FertilizeFlorida.com He coddled the communists, sided with socialists. Now Joe Biden is lying. He will raise taxes on the middle class, and his liberal agenda will cost millions of jobs. Because he's a career politician, past his prime, too weak to rebuild our nation. But we won't let him. We will build a better future with courage, with strength, because we are America, and Donald Trump is our president. America First Action is responsible for the content of this advertising. This is the Weekly on ClickOrlando.com with Justin Warmith. Welcome back. Our guest this morning is Patricia Sigmund, a Democrat running for District 9 in the state Senate. Both Sigmund and her opponent, Republican Jason Broder, taking shots at each other in attack ads in a race that could be pivotal for the future balance of Florida's legislature. Where, where do you stand on police uh, reform and, and maybe some of the changes that, that you believe need to happen in the state of Florida moving forward? I think that what we've seen is that common sense criminal justice reform is something that is very, uh, very much wanted and needed by, by people across the spectrum of politics. You know, things like um, making sure that police wear body cameras and have them on when they're working all the time. And, and that protects everyone. Um, making sure that we are doing really good training about um, what implicit bias, which is something that, you know, it's widely recognized uh, with Harvard studies that, that everyone has implicit biases and we all need to be aware of those. We need to make sure we have good resources in the community for mental health because we can't expect our police officers to also be mental health counselors. And we need social workers and resources in communities so that we're dealing with the underlying concerns that, that people are dealing with rather than just trying to make it all about policing. Mm -hmm. um, we need to get rid of mandatory minimums in the criminal justice system for nonviolent, non-sexual crimes and get rid of prison overcrowding. And these kinds of things are not, uh, they are, they are not uh, wild ideas. They are simply common sense things that will make an, a justice system that just provides what we always wanted, which is equal justice for all. Mm -hmm. What about legalizing marijuana, recreational use? Yes, I think that it is an important part of our criminal justice reform because um, marijuana is one of these, you know, small possession marijuana is, is a big part of how a lot of criminal cases get started and it creates criminal records for so many people that um, follow them throughout their lives and impede their ability to, to move forward and, and get jobs and work. And we know that um, it is just an important part of, of taking some of the load off of the criminal justice system so that the cases that are properly in the criminal justice system can have more attention and resources. We can't, we can't overload our criminal justice system and then expect it to work properly. And then also look at the economic benefits. I mean, look at what happened with Colorado, um, the economy boom that they had, the, the boost to their education dollars. You know, we're coming out of COVID-19 here with the need for a lot of economic stimulus and, and, and generating um, a good economic benefit and uh, the tax revenue from legalized marijuana would do that. And of course it would be properly regulated so that it would not be in the hands of, of uh, children. You know, public education, as we've touched on, the, the governor um, raising starting pay for, for teachers, it, do you think that's enough to really improve uh, public education and, and what else do you believe needs to happen at the state level? It's, it's not enough. Uh, raising teacher pay for starting teachers is, is not, is not the, the answer by itself because we have veteran educators, people who've been there for 10, 20 years, people who've been there for you know, long periods of time and they, they need to be appreciated and supported and the, the, 
the tide needs to lift all all the boats, uh, not only the the beginning teachers. And and this is a this is a big issue. And we have people. It's not only teachers. We have guidance counselors. We have we have a whole host of educators. We have bus drivers. We have people who maintain the safety in the schools and who clean the schools. All of these educators and support personnel, all of them are struggling to make ends meet. And so we can't, we, you know, we, we take our kids and we put them in school buses to drive to school with, with bus drivers who aren't being paid enough. And they're working two or three jobs and they're tired. How is that safe? How is that right? These people are taking that precious cargo to school every day. I put my kids on those school buses, you know, throughout until they started driving to school. So I think that we have to just look at public education as something that really is our community. It's our future. It's our, it's our economy. It's, it represents all of it. And it, and it really, be, it is the foundation for, for a great community and a great economy, building our, our future leaders, our business owners, our small business owners, our, our workers. Mm -hmm. So no, we, we need to fully fund public education and stop the flow of billions of dollars out into the charter management companies that's happening right now. Um, the, the Pico dollars piece of that really um, is shocking to many people when they hear about it because you have Pico dollars that will give millions of dollars to a charter management company to build a charter school. And when those are public dollars, all of it. And when those public, when those charter schools close, that property that they got on tax dollars, they get to keep it. So that is just a huge corporate giveaway to a private charter management company. And they're very wealthy and they have billions of dollars in property. So these kinds of things, you know, let's take that money and put it back into public ed and pay our educators across the board um, with the respect and support they deserve so that they can give a top flight education to our kids. You know, unemployment has um, really, it's not going away and the system itself is, as we all know and has as we've all followed has been shoddy um how, what's the first step that needs to be taken to fix florida's unemployment system so we have to create a system that is designed to provide that benefit rather than a system that is designed as it currently is to deny that benefit i've spent over 20 years representing people in fighting for their unemployment appeal, in their unemployment appeals, fighting for those benefits when they've been denied. So I know it wasn't good before 2011, and it got much, much worse after the 2011 changes that, that actually my opponent, Jason Broder, voted for. And we know from the facts that have come out that it was well understood at that time by, by Jason Broder and all of the people that were voting for this thing that it was designed to make it look like there were fewer people unemployed. So what they did was they took away all the in-person health help centers. They cut the benefits down to uh, up to 12 weeks, which is very short period of time for people looking for a job. And, and they, they put impediments in taking away the presumption entitled of entitlement to benefits. That presumption was taken away. Um, all of that, putting it all online on a computer system that was was designed to fail. And then we have to remember, it wasn't just the passing of that in 2011. Audits were done in the subsequent years that showed this thing was a mess. Mm -hmm. And people that were in office, like my opponent, Jason Broder, did nothing to fix it in all those other years that they were still there. He was up there for eight years. That's seven years after this system was put in. And they still didn't fix it. So what do we need to do? We need to increase the weekly benefit. $275 a week is just, it can't, it can't keep the roof over your head and, and put food on the table so that you can go and try to find a job or get the training you need to get back to work. We need a longer period of time. You know, benefits used to be up to six months. And I know from my own practice experience, it takes many people that long, even though they're working at it every day, to find a job, get a job, and actually get back to work. And for some people, if they have to have retraining or they're in a really difficult industry, you know, it can take even longer. So we have to make sure that people have that support. And then we need to make sure that people have other kinds of support, like support to, to keep themselves, um, you know, healthy and motivated and, and, and in, good, in a good mental place while they're looking for jobs. You can't go into a job interview 
you know, depressed and expect to come off well. But the problem is it's a very depressing problem when you don't have a job and you're not finding a job. We, we need to do that. We need to restore the in-person help centers. So folks who are fired don't have to do battle with a call center that doesn't answer their calls and a, and a computer system that's broken. They can take their pilot papers, walk into an in-person help center and say, help me with this. Mm -hmm. And that, that used to be available and it really needs to be available again. And before we go, I do want to mention we tried to get a hold of Sigmund's opponent, Jason Broder, for an interview as well, but we never did hear back. As always, for the latest information on this year's election, just head to clickorlando.com slash results 2020. I'm Justin Mormuth. Have a great Sunday.